Hello, welcome to uh, the porch. This is Kevin Stoda, and this is the Kevin Stoda channel. Um, I'm gonna read from you today an article called The View, and it says we've been here before. It's referring to the um, pandemic of polio that started in 1916. And it's a warning to us because it compares to what we're facing now. And it does it in a very fairly balanced way. This comes from the New York Times. Um, and there's a right way to reopen America. And this isn't it uh, from a couple weeks ago. Um, this article is by Jeffrey Kluger. It starts out, Welcome to Two Americas and the Two American Health Crisis. The coronavirus epidemic of 2020 and the polio epidemic of 1916. Now is then there are no proven cures. Now is then there's no vaccine. Now is then there's plenty of hooey going around, but there's a lot to learn from that long ago tragedy too. All right, it, learn patience and we'll be able to compare it to what's happening now a little bit better. There's somebody being given a polio shot back in the 50s. I remember I got my polio shot uh, and a booster some years later. Um, the story goes like this. Comparisons are more commonly drawn between the 1918 flu pandemic and today, but the polio outbreak two years earlier is actually the more apt one. Today we hear nonsense about injecting disinfectant into the body to uh, battle coronavirus. Back then it was hanging mother uh, mothballs around the children's necks to prevent the scourge, popularly known as infantile paralysis. Today there's the hyping of the malaria drug, hydro, uh, hydroxychloroquine to battle a disease it was not meant to battle. Back then it was mixing a paste made of wintergreen, Russian thyme, and oils of rosemary, kajiput, and wood, and rubbing them into your muscles. If you think sheltering in place and your climate controlled Wi-Fi screaming and streaming cable equipped home seems tough, try doing it in the blistering summer of 1916, before there were air conditioning, before there was internet, or before there was television. As Mark Twain, Twain is said to have said, history does not repeat itself, but it often rhymes, and the two epidemics 104 years apart are forming a tidy couplet. New York and other cities shut down then, as they have shut down now. In the first week of uh, July 1916 alone, 552 children in New York's five boroughs were stricken with polio, and more than 1,000 the second week. Even before that feverish fortnight, the city health commissioner, Haven Emerson, a uh, great-grand-nephew of the poet Ralph Waldo Emerson, made it his business to keep New Yorkers apart. Children under 16 were not permitted in crowded public places, open-air movies, uh, a new summer attraction were forbidden. Fourth of July celebrations were canceled. I remember in March that, uh, yeah, teens weren't allowed out at night um, here in Kansas City. Uh, as COVID-19 might be, uh, polio is a, reason, is a seasonal disease, though the polio virus prefers the hot months and the SARS COVID V2, which causes COVID-19, is at least thought to prefer the cool periods of the year. Now as in 1916, the push for a vaccine is thus a cyclical one, a race against a viral time bomb set to go off by the calendar. But let's take perspective. While the clamor for a vaccine was loud after the polio epidemic of 1916, the wait was long. It was not until the summer of 1935 and uh, President Roosevelt was in office that there was hope in the form of two great field trials, one by Dr. Maurice Brody and one by Dr. William Park of New York City uh, Department of Health and one by Dr. John Colmer of Temple University in Philadelphia. In Colmer's case, the vaccine involved using a weakened polio virus, one that wouldn't cause symptoms but would still conf confer immunity. In the case of Park and Brody, the technique involved a killed virus that would work more or less the same way. 9,000 children were injected with the Park Brody vaccine that summer and 10,000 with Comer's version. Both were disasters. In some cases, causing the very polio they were intended to prevent. 
and others leading to infection and inflammations. Six children died of vaccine-caused polio. In November, Comer and Brody were summoned to the annual meeting of the American Public Health Association for an open shaming delivered in twin reports, one of which ended with a damning conclusion that Comer might as well be guilty of murder. Gentlemen, Comer said, in response, this is one time I wish the floor would open up and swallow me. It would be another 20 years until 1955 before Dr. Jonas Salk would develop a successful killed virus vaccine. That meant 39 years between the epidemic in 1916 and the moment when science would at last have its way with the disease. Americans in lockdown now might seem almost spoiled to be chafing at being told to wait up to 18 months before a vaccine against SARS-CoV-2 becomes available. Though optimistic projections suggest that the breakthrough could come as early in January, but of course, who's going to get the first uh, shots? But as the science changes, expectations do too. We can now make vaccines faster than ever. Still, some things remain the same. Americans separated by scourges, scourges more than a century apart, share the same fate and the same worry, the same loneliness and lockdown and grief for lost loved ones. Diseases don't change their character and human beings don't much either. But science presses ahead and in our impatient 21st century, that's something for which we should be very deeply grateful. That's a good thought. Um, we have uh, a lot of people concerned about uh, all kinds of things, lost jobs and uh, getting back to work and that sort of thing. Um, but there's a lot of uh, other types of stress and worries too. I think about uh, the fact that uh, 100 million people have already died. I mean, 100,000 people have already died in the United States, well beyond what's the rate in other countries uh, of similar populations. Um, we have to figure out what we did wrong. Just moving on and, and saying we got to get back to work is not balanced. Uh, the author, another author in the same magazine, The Risk of Reopening, The Risk of Reopening. Uh, you know, a lot of people don't think that we should be giving up grandma and grandpa just uh, to get back to work. But we do have to have a balanced look at things. And there were riots in the 1916 and 1918 to reopen the cities too. Uh, Let's look at the look at the total rate. We have now uh, something like 35 times the death toll of the 9/11 terrorist attacks just from this one virus. More than uh, U.S. combat death, double the U.S. combat deaths in the Vietnam War, and one quarter of the total global casualties from the coronavirus epid pandemic as a whole. At the same time, the national lockdown is designed to halt the spread of the disease that pushed uh, 33 million to 40 million Americans out of work and forced hundreds of thousands of small business owners to board up their shops and left one in five children uncertain where they'll find their next meal. That's a lot of people who are looking for food. It says something about our country, doesn't it? It's the worst economic crisis since the Great Depression and with some economists uh, forecasting unemployment to soar past 20%, 25%, a second one is a real concern. As the death toll has rung out against the crescendo of economic despair, Americans have had no time to mourn. Instead, we've been pulled into an increasingly heated debate that pits two tragedies against one another. In exchange for jobs, our livelihoods, the ability to pay our rent, how much death are we willing to bear? How many tens of thousands of lives are we willing to sacrifice so that the rest of us can work and live outside our homes? How many tens of uh, thousands of lives are we willing to sacrifice so that, that the economy uh, will be successful in November for President Trump's election? Uh, this, is pushing, uh, this is why the president is pushing hard for um, opening and the businesses. But Public health officials are raising alarm. Remember on March, May 12, infectious disease expert David, uh, Dr. Anthony Fauci, a 
key member of Trump's own coronavirus tax force, told the Senate panel that easing social distancing restrictions too quickly risk multiple outbreaks throughout the country that will result in needless suffering and death. It didn't have to be this way. There's no reason that wealthiest country in the world, the United States, the nation that rebuilt Europe, that went to the moon, that claims exceptionalism as its birthright, should have to choose between economic resilience and protecting the lives of its most vulnerable citizens. Countries that acted more quickly to curb the spread of the virus have limited the damage on both fronts. In the early days of their fight against COVID-19, New Zealand, Norway, and Switzerland tested their populations at nearly 40 times the rate of the U.S. in those months, uh, per capita that is, and now they have one-fifth the death rate. Having failed in its response, uh, the U.S. now risks uh, making matters worse. Despite roughly 1,800 deaths per day and rising infection rates in, in parts of the country, at least 41 states are pushing crazily to uh, end restrictions. In many cases, governors are plunging ahead with reopening despite failing to meet key benchmarks established by public health officials. As a result, draft uh, projections predicted, uh, provided by the Federal Emergency Management Agency included a revision that could see uh, 3,000 or more Americans dying daily in June. To avoid these uh, shocking death rates, Americans should look at what has occurred elsewhere. Industrialized nations in Europe and Asia have begun opening up their economies by relying on continued social distancing, widespread testing, and a network of contact tracing to identify and contain new outbreaks. South Korea built an innovative digital infrastructure to identify and track every new coronavirus case within its borders. Germany set the standard for preventing test, preventative testing and an incremental staged plan for reopening. Experts at the American Enterprise Institute, John Hopkins University, and other places in the United States also have laid out detailed steps like this. They, uh, together, they would help the U.S. track the spread of the disease in our communities, clamp down on, our, on new outbreaks, and arrive at data-driven decisions to facilitate reopenings, safe reopenings. For now, for now, our leaders are following their recommendations only haphazardly at best. If we can't identify our missteps and learn from our country's successes and setbacks, we risk an even more catastrophic fall. Yeah, we're making some progress with the virus. Um, and it is summer, and there might be less uh, problems with the virus in summer, but they'll come back. Um, we need to reflect on what our mistakes are. We need to uh, realize it takes time. We need to have patience. And we need to think about helping our unemployed. That doesn't mean we have to give up grandma and grandpa. All right. Thank you for letting me share this from the porch. This is Kevin Stoder reading two articles uh, from Time Magazine. Uh, from the May 25th edition. There's a right way to reopen America. This isn't it. Right. Uh, I do hope we get more uh, help for our first responders. Uh, it was reported yesterday in the news that um, nearly 600 uh, nurses and doctors and medical professionals have died since the outbreak began. And uh, many hospitals are hoarding uh, and not allowing the staff there to have enough equipment. In other cases, the hospitals don't have enough equipment. Um, but we need to make this a safer country for all Americans. And that's got to start with compassion for our healthcare workers and our poorest. Because of, as we all know, how you treat the poorest amongst us is how our society will be judged. All right? Well, God bless you today. This is Kevin Stoda from On the Porch, and I hope you keep in touch with the news and share these facts with others. I share this one uh, story today because I want people to know what we already knew about um, the mishandling of the coronavirus in the states and how most of us are concerned about the matter and learning from it and doing better and taking care of our poor people. Thank you for listening. This is Kevin Stoda's channel. Have a good day.